Come on. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. We got people rolling in here. Good evening. Hello. How's it going? It's going pretty good. I'm about five minutes from my house, but I'm online. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Okay. Fantastic. We'll give it we'll give it a couple minutes here. It looks like looks like we got a couple people running running behind a little bit. So we'll give it just a couple minutes. Get started in numbers. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started and whoever's not here will just uh, join us when they do. If that's cool with everybody, make sure. All right. Good deal. Well, good evening, everyone. Hope you're well. Uh, let's see. Why don't we why don't we pray and we'll get we'll get started here. God, we are um, we're so thankful for you today. We're thankful for the ways that you work in our lives. Um, even all the things that you are doing behind the scenes that we don't see and we don't even know that you're doing. 
we give you praise. Uh, we're thankful for Jesus. And we're thankful that we have a uh, representative when we come before you. Um, we're thankful for the forgiveness that you, for the forgiveness that you give us through His sacrifice. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Well, we've got six of us. Six of us so far. So we left off. And uh, numbers was, are there any questions about anything before we start class? Anybody have any questions about anything we've gone over or questions about homework or writing assignments or, or anything? Yes, no, maybe so. I don't see anybody going off mute over here, so. I'm so there's only two writing assignments total, right? Correct. Yes. Uh, each one is one essay. And each one is one essay. And I, I got both of yours and I just, I, I graded one and I'll, I'll give you the other one uh, here in a week or so. Couple okay. Weeks. I, I, for some reason, I thought it was two essays each. So I just turned them oh, both in just I in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nope. Just one each. Perfect. Cool. 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 All right. So numbers is starting at this point. Um, we we get out of some of this. Uh, oh, talking about census and numbers and um, different tasks for different groups of people for different tribes and different particular people within particular tribes. Um, we we sort of move from this section at the foot of. Mount Sinai, and now we are hopping into this section where they're where they're going to do some traveling. And we we be, we started this just a little bit. They're they're traveling. It really it really starts to make numbers look a whole lot like Exodus. Looks like a whole lot like Exodus. It looks like a a people who. Um, Mm, they're not happy about very much going on around them at all. Uh, it's almost kind of like like taking my my two year old daughter on a car trip. Is kind of what it sounds like. Where every every twenty minutes, there's something else that is something else that is wrong. Something else that is not going the way exactly that she wants it. Um, she does much better now. She's four. She's she's a big four year old, and so of course she's um, way more grown up. And she thinks she's she's like seventeen or eighteen. But <laughs> um, but uh, but man, car rides with her were rough. They were so rough. My son, he he traveled amazing. He traveled amazing. But my daughter just man, there was something wrong every second of the trip. And every second of the trip, she wanted to be somewhere besides where she was. You encountered that in, in your own life, maybe a little bit, um, where uh, you're in elementary school, fourth grade. Oh, I can't, I just can't wait until I'm in middle school. You're in middle school. Oh, I just can't wait until I'm in high school. You're in high school. Oh, I just can't wait until I graduate and I get to be an adult and I get to do this and I get to do that. And then, oh, I can't wait for this. And then I can't wait for this. And then you get all those things and you want to go back to being five or six or, <laughs> and we're just, we're just never content where we are. There's this, there, there always seems to be, um, what's, what's the, what's the phrase, uh, greener, Grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah, the grass is always greener on the other side. And that's, that's sort of what it seems like the Israelites are experiencing a little bit. Um, Numbers takes on a different flavor, though, than Exodus with the complaining and with the, with the grumbling and with the, uh, I would even say, I venture to say disbelief. Uh, they've they've watched God do all of these amazing things. God has provided for them. He has led them. He is visibly among them. 
they they see people every single day who they know for a fact have his spirit within them um uh, they see Moses, they see the 70 elders, um, they, they see their visible reminders of who God is, how great, powerful he is, how he provides for them, how he leads them, how he protects them. They're visible reminders of that every single day. And yet, and yet they're still fearful. They're still um, they, they, they live lives almost of disbelief, as if God is not who he says he is, as if he's not who he claims to be. Um, and God's response to this complaining, to this grumbling, to this uh, life of disbelief and actions that, that denote disbelief, um, his response to that in Numbers is different than it was in Exodus. In Exodus, there was, there was patience. Um, not that God isn't patient and gracious in Numbers as well, but he responds a little bit differently. And, you know, some of that may be, may be because of the golden calf incident. Um, there, there's, been, there's been some big things that have gone on. Um, uh, just the repeated disbelief. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that happen in numbers. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see God's response. It's interesting to see his response. So let's, let's hop in. Let's, um, we talked about trumpets. We talked about people complaining. We talked about uh, elders who are appointed to aid Moses, uh, there's quail, and then there's a plague, and then and not only are all the people opposing Moses and wanting to go back, but uh, but Miriam and Aaron oppose Moses also. They're um, why does why does Moses get to speak for God? Has God not also spoken through us? Why why does Moses get all this, and we get we we don't get all the things that Moses does? Um, Miriam is struck with leprosy, and then we've got we've got the spies who are sent out. So, chapter thirteen. Let's let's pick up there. So, um, God tells Moses to send out some men to spy out the land of Canaan. Go and check it out. I'm giving this land to the people of Israel. <clears throat> I think that term there is uh, is interesting. It's it's not that it's not that they are taking Israel. I mean, not Canaan. It's not that Israel is taking Canaan. It's not that they are defeating Canaan. It's not that they are going to overpower Canaan. It's not that um, they're going to make treaties and and politically combine with everybody in Canaan and be able to stay there and hang out. It is that God is giving. Canaan to them. Uh, you see that same sentiment in the New Testament, especially in 1 Corinthians, that talks a lot about spiritual gifts. Um, spiritual gifts are called spiritual gifts for a reason because they are gifts from God. They're not things that, that people earn. For book 1 Corinthians over and over and over and over and over and over again talks about what God has given them and what God has done for them because you got a whole bunch of people who think that they're better than everybody else. Um, so we're reminded here, again, that this people of Israel is something because God has made them something. Um, they were slaves. They were, they were slaves. And um, let's see. They were slaves. And they are something now because God yeah. has made them because God has made them something. Um, so send men out to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. So they send one from each of the tribes. And uh, we've got Shemua, we've got Shaphat, we've got uh, Caleb, we have 
Egal, we have Hoshea and Palti and Gadjo and Gaddy. Now we can just keep on going. Aniel. I mean, the only two names that, that we remember uh, probably are Joshua and Caleb, right? Because they're the only people who are going to get to see this land again. Uh, so they go out and see what's going on, whether the land is good or bad, whether the cities and camps, uh, whether there's strongholds, whether people are rich or poor, whether there's trees, um, bring some fruit of the land versus the season of the first ripe grapes. So show us, show us what the land has to offer. So they go out, they check it all out. And uh, at the end of 40 days, they return from their spying. They all come back to Moses and Aaron. And um, 10 of the spies, of course, say, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So it looks great. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negeb. Uh, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. Uh, but then Caleb speaks up. He quiets the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. The men who had gone up with them said, we're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we are. So these ten men brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying the land through which we have gone to spy it out as a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim and we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. Uh, and of course they say all this and all the people say, oh yeah, that's, no, surely you're not right. They're, we don't have anything to be scared of. No, that's not what they say. People raised a loud cry and all the people wept that night and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, we should have died. It would have been better for us if we would have died in the land of Egypt. Oh, that we would have died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become a prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. So several things happen here. Um, they reject God. They have a disbelief in, um, in him, in his character, in his purposes, and in his promises. Um, the God who is very visibly dwelling in their midst. And... Um, they reject the, the leader, who the leaders who God has, has placed over them. They want a new leader. And uh, they, they want to go back to where they were. They want to go back. And uh, this, is, this is when things really, really, really start to fall apart. Uh, Moses and Aaron... They're pleading, they fall on their knees, Joshua and Caleb. Um, they, they have a little speech, the land we, which we pass us by out, exceedingly good land that the Lord delights in us. He will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only don't rebel against the Lord. Don't fear the people of the land for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones, but the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. So not only, not only do they want to go back, not only are they rejecting the leaders, they are ready to stone the people who continue to have faith that God is who God says he is and that God will do what God says he will do. Uh, they're ready to put Joshua and Caleb to death. God's response, how long will this people despise me? 
How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. But of course, then Moses goes and intercedes for the people again. Um, Egyptians will hear of it, for you brought up this people in your might from among them. They will tell the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, O Lord, are in the midst of this people. For you, O Lord, are seen face to face. Your cloud stands over them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if you kill this people as one man, then the nations who have heard your fame will say it is because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land that he swore to give it to them, that he has killed them in the wilderness. So now, please, let the power of the Lord be great, as you have promised, saying, The Lord is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, forgiving iniquity and transgression. But he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Please pardon the iniquity of this people according to the greatness of your steadfast love, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Um, God's people have always needed someone to stand on their behalf in front of God. Always. Um, here, they needed Moses. They needed Moses to go between them and God. Uh, they're going to continue to need the, the Levites, the priests, to do so. They continue to need prophets to do so. Um, you, you see, you see uh, a couple of times prophets who, who uh, have a back and forth with God. Amos does at, at one point. Amos uh, says, God, please don't do this. And God says, okay, I'll... I'll let this go for a little bit. And then Amos says, please, God, don't do this. And God says, okay. And then, and then Amos sees just how bad it really is, and Amos doesn't ask anymore. He doesn't ask anymore at that point. Um, Habakkuk. Habakkuk is given a prophecy about what's going to, what's going to happen. And uh, it's devastating. It's absolutely devastating. And he has a back and forth with God about it. It's not, God doesn't just go through the prophet to the people. Uh, the prophet has conversations with God too. And you see Moses doing this. Moses is kind of the, uh, the archetype of that. Um, he's the archetype. He's the model, the example of somebody who goes between God and people. And of course, our ultimate our ultimate go-between now is Jesus. Um, Moses is very much, in a lot of ways, an archetype of, of Jesus. Um, but uh, so, so then we have this, some, some more from God. Uh, let's see. Truly as I live. So he's pardoned. He pardons them. We're, we're going to get to some conversation here in a minute. Um, he pardons them according to the word of Moses, but verse 21, chapter 14, verse 21, truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these 10 times and have not obeyed my voice shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers and none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring into the land into which he went and his descendants shall possess it. Possess it. Um, so none of the men who saw his glory and who saw all the signs and all the things that he did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet continue to test God, continue to to be faithless, really. Um, uh, and we see 10 times. That, I mean, that, that could be a literal 10 times. Uh, it could be 10, 10 is just a number for completeness or fullness in Scripture a lot of times. Um, so so it, it says 10. It could be a literal 10, but it could also just be um, like fully, completely, um, at every turn, have not, have, have seen my glory and yet still have not obeyed my voice. They've still continued to 
to test me to see if I am who I say I am. Uh, and he keeps on saying, how long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumbled against me. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness and all of your number listed in the census from 20 years old and upward have grumbled against me. No one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell except Caleb and Joshua, but your little ones who you said would become a prey, I will bring in and they shall know the land that you have rejected. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in this wilderness. Your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and shall suffer because of your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day, you shall bear my iniquity for 40 years, and you shall know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. Surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they shall come to a full end, and there they shall die. So, um, Here's where Numbers takes a, a very different turn than Exodus. In Exodus, their nonstop complaints are tolerated. It's almost, it's almost as if God understands that a people who have been long oppressed are entitled to a little bit of grumbling. When you've been oppressed for a really long time and you're coming out of that, when you've been in a particular life for a really, really long time and you're coming out of that, um, you don't typically change overnight. It is a, it is a slow process. Change, change is a slow process. Now, sometimes, sometimes there's immediate change in people. Um, some, sometimes, sometimes somebody says, you know what? That was the last time for that, and boom, it's done, it's over, and life is totally different. Uh, but sometimes change is a, is a long process. Sometimes, um, sometimes you make decisions for change to do things differently, and uh, your heart is there for the change, but then there's a lot of things along the way that make that change difficult. Um, here, they continue to be called back to a life that really wasn't very good wasn't a particularly great, amazing life, and yet they continued to be tempted by it and wanting it. Man, it's, um, it's, it's, it's difficult. But numbers, numbers it's, it's, it's not tolerated quite so much. It's not tolerated quite so much. God, God kind of says, you know what? You have seen enough of me. You've seen enough of what I've done for you on your behalf. You have seen miracles in front of your face every single day, uh, and, yet, and yet you still have no, you have no faith. Um, and, and not only do you not have faith, but, but their people are, are turning their backs on him. They want to turn their backs on, on him uh, and just return to where they were before without God. Go back to Egypt. Go back to Egypt's gods. Go back to slavery. And they, they want to go back. So, um, so Numbers looks a little different. It has a different feel to it. It's, it's um, a lot of the same stories. We've got manna from heaven. We've got rocks producing water. We've got uh, battles with desert tribes we've, and, and nonstop complaints. But God reacts differently. He reacts differently. They, they've seen the land. They've even seen the land that God wants to take them to. And they're still... They're still a group of faithless people. Um, so 32 through 33. It's a lament. Um, let's see. It's, no, I'm sorry. Um, so the judgment comes down in 32 through 33 is what I was saying. But, but verse, verse 11 how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? It, this is not this is not icy indifference. This isn't, this isn't a God who has uh, hardened his heart against, against this people who he has um, 
been working on behalf of. Uh, this is this is a very mixed, sorrowful anger, almost like of of a wounded lover, you could say. Um, there's this God who loves his people dearly, and they continue to turn their backs on him. And he's there's there's sorrow, I think, in in that lament. Verse 27 sounds very similar. How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I've heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Um, it, it's there, there's sorrow here I'll mix in with the with the anger. Um, so God responds to Moses and he forgives, but there's but the forgiveness doesn't get rid of all the effects of sin. Did you notice that? There's forgiveness there, but the effect of their disbelief, the effect of their um, turning their backs on God is going to linger. The effects linger, and that's kind of how sin goes, isn't it? Even when there is forgiveness for sin, a lot of times the consequences of sin continue, and they continue to last. Um, I had hundreds of thousands of examples that we could throw out for that, but but sin and the way that it affects individuals and relationships that individuals are in, that sin can have lasting effect. But even if there's forgiveness, there, there is lasting effect to sin. And so you, you see that here, and there's there are, uh, there's lasting effects. People are not immediately going to be annihilated. There's, there's forgiveness, but, but the older generation is going to die. And here, here we see from census to census. See, the census is very different the first time than it is the second time. The census the first time is the census of the first generation. The census in chapter 26 is the census of the younger generation who will be going into Canaan. So uh, we have two very different censuses. Census? Sensei? Censuses? It's hard to say. Mm. Um, so um, the older generation is going to die. Their children, they're going to inherit the land, but they're going to suffer for a little while because of it. They're going to have to wander around in the desert for 40 years. Uh, the effects of sin reverberate. They, uh, and they need constant salvation. They need constant salvation. Another example of this, uh, I think it's a, uh, I think it's maybe included in numbers specifically because it is an example of this. Check this out. So we have this weird story in chapter 21, verses four through nine about, uh, about snakes and um, snakes are sent in and they're biting all the people. Well, everybody's forgiven, but what sticks around? The snakes, right? The snakes stick around. They're still there biting people. Uh, even, though, even though God has relented and God has forgiven, the snakes are still around biting everybody. They're not removed and they're not kept from biting. The effects or the consequences of their sin continues. But God works on those consequences and effects by providing a means in which to heal them, uh, which actually was like a, an Egyptian medicinal sort of thing that God sort of um, usurped. <laughs> it was, uh, so um, Moses stands up with the snake, and every time somebody looks at the snake, they're healed from their snake bites. So the consequence of their sin doesn't go away. The snakes are still there. They're still being bitten. The sin is still affecting them, but God is providing healing for them in the midst of 
those consequences that are still going on. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is, this is a very visual example of what's going to happen to this people who are, who are left to wander in the desert for 40 years. God forgives them, but there's still consequences for their sin. And that's, that's a very biblical idea. How about David? David and Bathsheba, right? There, there are things that happen with David and Bathsheba and with Uriah. Um, David realizes that he's been found out. He falls on his face. Psalm 51, one of the most beautiful psalms, I think, um, when David is just absolutely and completely, totally broken. Um, he's broken before God. God forgives him completely, but, there, but there's still consequence that happens because of how much David erred um, and the, the hurt and the pain and just all the, all the stuff that he caused for all kinds of people, right? Um, so those consequences are still there. It's not that he doesn't have to deal with the fallout from, from the relationships that he has sinned in and erred in, uh, but he's forgiven. So uh, forgiveness doesn't always mean that, oh, yeah, there's no, there's no consequences anymore. My child um, does something absolutely terrible, uh, whatever it is. Or, or even not that terrible, um, I, can, I can forgive them, I can love on them, um, and still administer consequences because of what they've done, uh, which is called discipline. Um, and, and they need that, otherwise they're probably going to jump right back into doing exactly the same thing that they were doing before, right? Um, they, they need to understand that there are consequences for, for actions. Um, so, uh, so God forgives them, but he allows the effects of their sin to continue. 21 through 25 is interesting because he basically says, eh, what goes around comes around. In verse 28, I will do to you or I will allow it to happen to you the very things that I heard you say you wanted to be done. He's in essence saying, your will be done, not mine. Kind of a reversal of what Jesus said in the garden. Remember when Jesus is praying in the garden and he says, not my will, but yours be done? Well, this is, this is a little different. This is God saying, okay, I will let you have exactly what you are grumbling and complaining for. You, uh, you, desire, you desire death. You say it would be better to die here in the wilderness than it would be to continue on this journey. So God says, I will let you have what you ask for. They say, it would be so much better for us to return to Egypt. He says, oh, they get very close to doing that. Verse 25 this is uh, chapter 14. Now, since the Amalekites and Canaanites dwell in the valleys, turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Just turn around. Turn around. Go ahead. And he says, you think that your children are going to suffer a plundering? No. They are going to suffer, but it's going to be because of you, not because of anybody else. They're going to suffer because of you. God doesn't necessarily introduce judgment here. He simply lets them have what they've asked for. He lets them have what they want. Um, which sounds a lot like Romans, by the way. Romans chapter 1 makes you wonder if uh, Paul, who wrote Romans, ever read Numbers. I bet he did. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I bet he knew numbers forwards, backwards, left, right, upside down, and inside out. Um, I, though, apparently can't find Romans. Here we go. Um, let's see here. 
let's just start. Let's start in verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18 of Romans. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature. They've been clearly perceived. They've been seen ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds, and animals, and creeping things. So um, they claimed to be really wise. They made a whole bunch of animals uh, in in and images and made those things into God instead of worshiping the God who made all of those things. Verse 24, therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to be what ought not be done. And it continues, um, if you want something bad enough that is big time against God, it's going to let you have it. It's going to let you, it's going to let you have it. If your back's turned to him, he's, he's, and, and you have no, no intention of turning around, he will, he will let you have what you want. That's what he does. That's what he does with Israel here. Um, now, he might send a giant fish to swallow you up until you, until you figure it out and turn back around, but, um, but he's going to let you go your direction. It's, um, it's part of, I'm going to fail to be able to read my notes now. Um, you know, God could have just with the snap of his fingers, he could have fixed all of the things that they were complaining about. With the snap of his fingers, he could have um, he could have even changed people's minds. Probably, um, he could have he could have made the situation better. He could have um, he could have uh, just with the snap of his fingers changed people's hearts and said, "Nah, no, 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 you have a better heart about who I am," and did his stuff and and made it happen. But if he does that, then he compromises their freedom, compromises their ability to choose, uh, their ability to choose him over everything else. And, um, and that's a, that's a, gotta be a difficult thing. It's a line that, that you walk as a parent. Um, this line of when, when do I, when do I grab you by the arm and overpower you and say, no, you are not going to do that right now and grab your child in a big bear hug and hold them until, until they, they're so tired that they fall asleep. I mean, I don't know if you've dealt with tantrums before, but, but you know, this, where, where is this line between, between forcibly, not allowing someone to do something that is uh, going to, that you know could be painful for them um, and letting them have their own way for a little bit. It's difficult. It's a difficult, it's a difficult line. And um, God, is, God is walking that line as only God can here. Um, uh, he's going to discipline, but he's still going to allow people to, to choose their way. 
And there's risk in that. There's risk in allowing people to have their own way. There's, um, there's risk in watching your child climb to the top of the monkey bars instead of being underneath them like they're supposed to be. Uh, but, you know, where, where is that line? God's walking that line. So, you know, he probably could have snapped his fingers and changed all this in a second, but, but he's, uh, this, this idea that people get to choose him is, uh, I think, something that is important to the nature of God. Also, though, for the sake of creation, God's not going to compromise in holding the Israelites to high standards because all of creation is going to suffer if he just says, ah, oh, do whatever you want and I'll continue to bless you and do everything for you. And so, so for the sake of creation, God's not, not going to completely compromise in holding them to, to these, these high standards. And really, I mean... He's there in front of them doing all this amazing stuff. And he, he gives them, I mean, the standards that he's asked them to follow aren't, aren't too terribly hard probably for where they are. But, it's, but it's, less, it's less like the specific rules and more the just overall faithlessness and disbelief that you see their attitudes towards him. This idea that he's not who he is, who he says he is, and he's not going to do what he says he's going to do. They're lack of belief in those things uh, leads to leads to their actions so um let's see let's move on a little bit here we've got some more laws that are given uh priests and levites miriam dies Moses brings some water again. Aaron dies. Uh, they start to encounter some places and some people who don't really want them around as they, as they continue on in this traveling through the wilderness. Uh, Moses is, writes letters to a couple of kings, and these kings say, nope, you're not going anywhere on our highway. It's called the King's Highway. Um, there's actually a real road that goes, goes there now. Um, it kind of follows along the, the same path that this road that they're trying to travel on would have gone. So they end up going around these nations. They're not forcing themselves on these nations at, at any point. But one, one of those nations then sends their armies out to attack them as they're, as they're going around, uh, around this group of people. And we don't really know exactly how established these nations were at this point. If they were more tribal and loosely connected, or if they were like actual kingdoms who'd been there for a while. Um, history doesn't really tell us. Scripture doesn't really necessarily tell us. So we don't know, we don't know how big they are. We don't know, uh, we don't know how established as a, as a kingdom that they were. We do know that they seem to have a, a king. Uh, although I think one, one had, there's like five different kings, it sounds like. Um, so so there, there's a varying degree of how established these people are, um, how organized these people are, but they're organized enough to have an army and send an army after, after Israel. Um, now that, that could be a very loosely defined army where you send out a call to all the, all the little villages uh, and all the little um, tribes within your, within your kingdom and say, hey, how many, how many men can you spare? And then everybody comes out with their pitchforks and Whatever. I mean, it could be it could be that kind of army. We don't we don't really know. Um, well, Israel they they go to battle with one, and it goes very poorly because it was not they, they didn't seek out uh, God as to whether they should go or not. Um, they there's there's a couple of others where they fare very well because they did seek out God and God told them to go, and they did um, during. During this time, Moses strikes a rock, and uh, he's, he gets frustrated. He gets upset with all the people, and he says, fine, let me do this for you. And this, uh, this one act of Moses saying, me and not God, 
uh, means that Moses doesn't get to go into the promised land either. He's not going to get to finish the journey into Canaan either, um, because then he had this sort of fit and forgot about God just for a minute. And God, God said, nah, we're not going to do that. Even with Moses, even with Moses in his moment of disbelief. Um, so then, then we get to chapter 22, this interesting story with Balak and Balaam. Ba Balak and ba um, Balaam is how we say it, I guess. Um, so Balak, the king of Moab, son of Zippor, uh, he sees... Israel, he sees what they've done to other places. He becomes fearful. And so he sends for the prophet Balaam of Peor. Uh, and uh, so back then, um, there, were, there were prophets. Prophets were a common thing, um, regardless of who your gods were. There were prophets around that you could hire to come and uh, prophesy on your behalf against someone else. So uh, Balaam, or Balaam, was one of these prophets for hire. The idea was that they had some sort of special connection to the gods or a special connection to the uh, spiritual realm or whatever you want to call it, um, some kind of special connection in that uh, when, when they spoke against a particular people or they, they prophesied that something was going to happen, then it was going to happen. And so, so these people would take money uh, so, that, so that they could go and pronounce some prophecy for somebody. So uh, Balak, he sends for Balaam and he's going to pay him a good, good chunk of change so that Balaam will go and prophesy against Israel. And Balak probably really believed that Balaam going and prophesying against Israel was going to mean that the Moabites would defeat the Israelites. Uh, so he sends for Balaam. And, but what you see is that even this, this prophet for hire, this prophet for hire, uh, even he knows at this point that Yahweh, God of Israel, Yahweh, the God of slaves, is not a God to be trifled with. And so he says, well, let me go inquire of Yahweh and find out if this is something that I can do or not. And God says, no, absolutely not. You will never, ever speak any words that I do not put in your mouth about my people. So he goes back and he tells Balak, no, nope, sorry, or there's a messenger from Balak. He says, nope, sorry, uh, I can't do that. I can only speak what, what God puts in my mouth. Which is interesting because Moses didn't think that he could speak the words that God was giving him. And yet here's, here's a prophet who's not really associated with God in the slightest or with the Israelites at all. And he comes and he says, eh, th there's nothing I can do. If Yahweh wants to speak through me, he's going to speak through me. It's very interesting. But then they come to him again and they say, oh, no, we really, really want to pay. You. Why don't you come and do this for us? And instead of saying, instead of saying, eh, God already told me. What does he do? He goes and he asks God again. You ever had somebody, like a child maybe, who, who you're in charge of at some point in time, and they say, can I, can I do this? And you say, no, absolutely not. And then five minutes later, five minutes later, they come back and they say, please, please, I really, really want to. Nope, I already said no. Don't you dare come and ask me again. <laughs> and then what do they do five minutes later? They come and ask you. I got in trouble for this so much when I was little. 
I would ask my mom over and over and over and over again if I could go do something until finally she would say, if you ask me one more time, you're grounded for the rest of your life. Not for the rest of your life, but for a really long time. And of course, I would ask again, and then I would be grounded. I'd get in more and more trouble. Well, um, Balaam, he goes back and he asks again. This is, I think, where he gets into trouble with his donkey and the angel. Um, God's anger was kindled because he went. The angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as his adversary. Now he was riding on the donkey. His two servants were with him, even though God had went ahead and told him to go. Right? This is, it, it gets, it's weird. It's hard to grasp here what's going on because when Balaam goes again, God says, okay, go. But you're only going to speak the words that I put in your mouth. So, um, so then Balaam goes. And so you're like, well, why is God upset with Balaam when he told him to go? I think it's probably because um, Balaam went back and asked again, even though God had already said, nope. But God decides to take Balaam and to use him. So you have this weird scene where the donkey sees the angel, but Balaam does not. The donkey rears up, scared, as any man or a beast should be in the presence of an angel. And um, uh, Balaam gets angry, and the God opens the mouth of the donkey, and the donkey speaks to Balaam. What have I done to you that you struck me these three times? I wish I had a sword in my hand, for then I would kill you. You've made a fool out of me. The donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you've ridden all your life? Is it my habit to treat you this way? Well, no. And God opens the eyes of Balaam, and he sees the angel of the Lord. And uh, Balaam now is properly scared and bows, bows down and falls on his face. Uh, but it's, um, and, and then he, he says, okay, I've sinned. I didn't know that you stood in the road. It was evil, I will turn back. But the angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with the men, speak only the word that I tell you. So Balaam went on with the princes of Balak. So Balak's all excited. Balaam has come. Balaam is going to go and stand in front of all the people and prophesy against, against Israel. But here's, here's what Balaam's oracles, his prophecies look like. From Aram, Balak has brought me, chapter 23, verse 7. The king of Moab from the eastern mountains, come curse Jacob for me and come denounce Israel. But how can I curse whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? For from the top of the crags I see him, from the hills I behold him. Behold, a people dwelling alone and not counting itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the upright and let my end be like this. And Balak says, what have you done? What are you doing? What am I paying for? I didn't bring you here to curse us. I brought you here to curse Israel. But you're, you're praising our enemies. I want you to curse our enemies. You've done nothing but bless them. His answer was, must I not take care to speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? And Balak says, well, let's go to another place. You'll just see a fraction of them, and you won't see all of them. Then, then curse them for me from there. Doesn't go very well again. Rise, Balak, and hear. Give ear to me, O son of Zippor. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind, has he said. And will he not do it, or has he spoken, and he will not fulfill it? Behold, I received the command to bless. He is blessed, and I cannot revoke it. He has not beheld misfortune in Jacob, nor has he seen trouble in Israel. The Lord their God is with them, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt, and it is for them like the horns of the wild ox. There is no enchantment against Jacob, no divination against Israel. Now it shall be said of Jacob and Israel, what has God wrought? Behold, a people is a lioness, it rises up, and as a lion it lifts itself, it does not lie down until it has devoured the prey and drunk the blood of the slain. Um, and Balak says, okay, don't curse them, don't bless them. Balaam says, didn't I tell you all that the Lord says that I must do? And Balak says, oh, okay, let's try one more time. Perhaps it will please God that you may curse them for me from there. Doesn't go very well then either. 
So Balak gets really angry, struck his hands together. Flee to your own place. I will certainly honor you, but the Lord has held you back from honor. Anyways, um, Balaam speaks on behalf of God and not against him. Because God said, you're going to say the things I'm going to say. And Balaam did. So Israel arrives. And there's a different tactic <laughs> that happens here. Um, the people of Israel began to have mm, sexual relations with the daughters of Moab. Um, and these daughters of Moab invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. The people ate and bowed down to their gods, chapter 25, verse 2, verse 3. So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. The Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people, hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. Behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of the meeting. So while God was having this conversation, somebody brings a Midianite, Midianite woman home to his family in the sight of everybody, unashamedly. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose, left the congregation, took a spear in his hand, and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Um, there's a lot going on here. Uh, they've been given all kinds of instructions about what it's going to be like once they start getting into um, Canaan and among lands of, of all of these other people. They end up in the land of the Moabites who are um, in the biblical story descendants of uh, one of Lot's two daughters. Um, and uh, they, they get wrapped up with Baal. And they get wrapped up with Baal worship, um, which again is, I mean, this, this, is like, this is like the golden calf all over again. It's all over again. And there's, there's things that lead them into the worship of Baal. Um, obviously, the daughters of Moab did, but um, uh, they start to make all these sacrifices to their gods, even though God's given them all these instructions about what their sacrifices are supposed to look like, about um, what their worship is supposed to look like, what their festivals are supposed to look like, what their relationships with other people are supposed to be like. Um, they, they fall right in with Moab. And um, uh, again, you see just uh, this with, with God in their midst, in their midst, visual, like visibly seeing God in their midst every single day. And they're, and they're, they're worshiping Baal. Uh, I think it's, it's interesting, the story that we're told about the, the person of Israel who um, brought the Midianite woman to his family right in front of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, completely unashamed that he is taking another lover home to his family right in front of them, uh, right in front of all of Israel, right? It's, it's, a, it's a very visual example of exactly what is happening with Israel and God and Baal. Here is God in their very midst, um, visibly in their very midst, in a cloud, in a pillar of fire, in... Uh, with tabernacle among them, with, with all of these things, they, they, the, the manna every morning, the quail, um, just all, all the things that God has 
has given them the ways that God is providing for them every single day, the miraculous ways that he is doing so, all these things right in front of them and in front of this God who is visibly there, they are going to worship Baal and going to worship some non-existent God, uh, even though Yahweh is right there in front of them. It's, it's a, this is a very visual example of exactly what all of Israel is doing as they, as they come upon the plains of, of Moab. Um, so, um, uh, plague ends and there's another census. Now the census is taken and now, now we are to the, um, the group of people who are, uh, going to inhabit Canaan. The last, the last of the older generation has gone away. And so we have a renumbering of all the people, um, the reason for two censuses here. And then, then we've got a lot of instructions. Um, we find out that Joshua is going to succeed Moses. And they have a very visual uh, kind of deal with him, them standing together in front of everyone where, where Moses is, is kind of like a... a formal giving of of the reins to someone else which i think was probably really important for the people to for the people to see and then they have a, a lot more instructions uh, that all have to do with this upcoming journey across the jordan river into canaan uh, and being among the people who they're going to be among a lot of the instructions have to do with you just saw what happened when you were around other people and you forgot about these instructions that I've given you immediately. Let me remind you, you're going to be among a whole bunch of people. These are the things that you need to remember as you get around all these other nations and all these other people who don't recognize me as Yahweh, as God. Um, so we've got all sorts of instructions about vows and offerings for different times and on the feasts and the festivals and the cities of refuge um and uh, uh then then we've got some some bickering that's going on among tribes there uh, some are going out to battle there's a couple that aren't everybody's getting really mad that these two aren't going out to battle but they're going out to battle and they're losing people and these guys are just sitting at home uh relaxing um so you have a whole bunch of stuff that's starting to happen between the tribes um, and then, uh, let's see, boundaries of the land. We've got different tribal issues and marriage of female heirs. And that, I mean, that, that kind of closes out numbers for us. Um, uh, numbers is a hard book, but in the end, in the end of numbers, uh, while there were definitely a whole bunch of rough patches, and while the the consequences of God didn't just snap his fingers and remove completely remove all the consequences of their continued disbelief, um, you see you see hope, and you see mercy, and you see forgiveness, and you see that uh, God is going to continue to bring about the promises that he promised, the purposes that he promised, the things that he promised. God's going to do what God said he was going to do. And that's kind of how Numbers ends, is him giving all these instructions, because I am still going to bring you, despite all of your disbelief, despite all of the things that, that you've done, despite all the ways that you've acted, I'm still going to bring this group of people into Canaan, like I promised. So it sort of ends with a note of hope uh, there. So that is book of Numbers. We'll do, we'll get into Deuteronomy next week. Any questions, comments? I think I just talked for like an hour and 10 minutes straight. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's pray and we'll call it done. God, we're thankful for you. We're thankful that in our grumbling and complaining and disbelief that, uh, 
that you still love us. That you still forgive us. And I pray that you help us to deal with, oh, all the consequences of the ways that, uh, that we've messed up in this life. Uh, we all have, and we've all got those things around. And God, I pray that you help us to deal with those things. Walk alongside us and help us help each other. Um, and I just pray that you'd be with us and all the different struggles of daily life that we've got going on, our families and uh, just in jobs and, and everything that's going on. God, I pray that you would be in each and every single one of, of our situations. You know our needs. You know the ways that we need help, and we simply put ourselves in your hands. Help us to walk out these doors and to uh, proclaim our faith in you through our words, but also through the way that we do our life every single day. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, Brother Dennis. Thank you. Yeah. Y'all have a good evening. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.